Austin asks a question, if it does become possible to actively reverse biological aging, what are some of the limits of this? He asks, how far could you push someone's biological age back from some given point in time? He's hinting at, is it better to wait once in your life and do it when you're 80 and drive it all the way back to 20? Or when you get to 50, should you constantly back it back a few years? The numbers aren't important here, but do you have any insight from the work you've done yet as to you, you, you touched on with the mice, you're not sure how many times you can do it. Do you see the way the process would roll out in the life of someone who grew up where these medications were fully available? We're getting some glimpses, right? These are still early days, um, and we've only been doing these for a couple of years, so there's not a lot. Here's, but here's what I know, is that unlike the Yamanaka factors that won the Nobel Prize, he just, that, that technology just rips the cells clean. You know, it's like brushing your teeth and ripping your teeth out. It's that that strong. But our method, it actually takes the cells back to a point and then they stop. There's this natural barrier to getting too young. Now, of course, if you get too young, you get cancer. But we're very lucky that if we turn it on for three, four weeks, um, the cells stop going backwards. So I think what's going to happen is, um, and we've actually engineered this for mice and now humans, is that it's this system is turned on by an antibiotic. Now, we're not using the antibiotic to kill bacteria. We're using it to turn on this treatment. So what we're going to do with, with the people, as we've done with the mice, is you put it in the eye, and it just sits there. You've got the genes in your eye. And then when you want to get your vision, your doctor will give you three weeks course of doxycycline, the antibiotic. It'll turn on the genes. And when you get your vision back, then you stop taking the antibiotic. And then I think what will happen is, you know, when your vision starts to fail again, whether it's in five or ten years, then you just take another course of antibiotics for three weeks and you get reset again. So, but we don't know how many times. We don't know uh, if you can um, do it a little bit each time. We've mainly been going for three weeks. We haven't done less than that. Um, but also the good news is we've we've reprogrammed an entire mouse for over a year. I think we, what did we do? 15 months of treatment. Uh, if anything, those mice had less cancer than a normal mouse. So we're pretty confident so far, well, let's say quietly confident, that we're not going to be causing harm, um, and actually it's remarkably safe so far. Um, one of the reasons for going for the eye, actually, is that it's a contained unit, and there are already drugs that use gene therapy in the eye for that reason. It's a little, it, I don't know how soon we'll be able to inject it into our veins and be reprogrammed completely. Um, we've got a way, ways to go, but, you know, we'll, we'll take it one step at a time. I'm about to ask a few more slightly scientific technical questions. Let me ask you one more big picture for the simple people like me in the audience question. I know there's a difference between being a life spanner and a health spanner, but in terms of just lifespan, what are your thoughts in this field? We, we, we hear some things. Some people say 150 is a magic number. If you can get to that old, you can live forever. Some people say there are people born now who live to be 150. 50. I've read somewhere once you get beyond about 105, the difference in ageing profile is not that great, 105 compared to 110, et cetera. In terms of just the, you know, the simplistic give me some numbers, how long do you think people could realistically live healthy lives within some foreseeable time from now? Well, we know that people can live close to 120 years, the maximum. Uh, the longest lived person in, ostensibly is 100, was 122 and the average age in most countries that are developed is 80. Um, you know, so that's 40 years we know that we can get. It's not impossible. So that's a long, you know, I'll take that if we can get everybody up to uh, 120. Uh, the important thing to remember is if you live to 120, it means that you're 100, still playing tennis, having a great time, multiple careers. It's not that you're extending the, the period of life when you're old. What we're talking about is extending the period when you're young. And actually people who live a long time die fairly quickly. It's the same for the mice we treat. And someone who lives over 100 costs the healthcare system a third of what everyone else does. Uh, but how far can we go? I think I was the first person in Australia to say that 150 number, that the first person could be born to live that long. The prime minister actually uh, used me uh, and then got in trouble for, for that quote. I also got in trouble for that quote. My colleagues, a couple of them took me aside and said, can you just stop saying that number? It's not a good look. And I said, well, do you think it's possible? And they said, yeah, but just stop saying it. It's not a good look, right? So especially with the reprogramming work, I think it's possible. 
that that is true. And people forget that children born today will see the 22nd century for sure. And, you know, that that's a long time away and there's a lot we can do uh, by then. Um, you can't really just use today's technology or even the next 10 years to extrapolate. So the, the other number that's interesting is every year you stay alive, you get another three months because technology is improving. And then if you get another year for every year of life, then, you know, things get pretty interesting. Uh, I don't think we're going to be there anytime soon. I think immortality, it's not even worth talking about. It'd be like asking the Wright brothers, uh, when are we going to the next uh, solar system? That's that's not even worth talking about, even though it'll happen one day. But will we be able to slow down aging to get most of us to 90 or 100 uh, within the next, within this century? I don't see why not. I think we're already proving that the science is working. There are already drugs on the market, as I mentioned, that if they were used widely, could extend lifespan, even though they're not being used widely for that. Um, so that's where we're at. You know, it's hard to predict, predict the future, and you're always wrong. Uh, but I, I know for sure that we're going to see a large jump in lifespan based on the science that I'm seeing come out of various labs around the world. I'm going to go into a few more slightly more technical questions now. Um, I'd suggest we are on the side of not getting too far down the scientific rabbit hole for fear of some people in the crowd losing us. But Sashin asks, how does it work? How does exercise and certain foods actually activate the longevity genes? What is it about these activities that turn them on? How can we tell which activities activate particular genes? Oh, well, we're, we're right on the cusp of that. So we don't know for sure which exercise is best for every individual and everybody's different. But what we do know is that uh, if you lose your breath, um, and you train, you will have more NAD in your body. The body makes more NAD as you exercise. Same for when you're hungry, your NAD levels go up. And these sirtuins, they use NAD as their fuel. And then resveratrol and the um, monounsaturated fatty acids are like the accelerator pedal. So you got the fuel, the accelerator, and that's how they work. But exercise mainly is making uh, NAD. The other thing that's interesting is when you're hungry, and you exercise, you start burning fat, right? We know that. Do you know what one of the byproducts of burning fat is in the body? It's oleic acid, the same monounsaturated fatty acid that you get from avocados and olive oil. So that may be why exercise is also good. It's liberating this accelerator pedal, mo pedal molecule, as well as raising NAD for the sirtuins. Now, AMPK is also activated, that one in the middle. Um, that's also true. And so also if you're hungry, that mTOR one that was on the left gets up, gets uh, turned in the right direction. So it's it's not an easy answer. There's a lot of things that go on that the body senses when there's a problem. Um, but I hope I gave you a good good flavor of what are the main things that happen.